If we want to automate things, then it's not enough to just be able to store numbers in boxes and perform arithmetic. We need to eventually be able to repeat stuff. And this is a topic in a programming course that bothers a lot of people, not unlike most of the other topics you've seen so far, but it bothers people because this is a question of developing the right kind of computational thinking mindset. We know that we want to repeat things, obviously, but it's a question of how do we design a task that can be repeated effectively? The point of this video is just to walk through the steps of automating something. Our goal is to save ourselves time. It's to use automation to save ourselves time. How can we save time using a program? Well, we can save time by, by writing code to allow us to perform a task that would take us a long time to perform. We can also save time by writing code to eliminate something that might be error prone, something where people might make mistakes if they do it by hand. So the point of the video is to introduce a new technique, which is something called a loop. And, uh, like I said in my earlier videos, we don't want to actually learn new techniques in this course unless we can't already do the thing that we want with existing techniques. So my first task to introduce loops is to prove that we need them, is to prove that it's worth learning a new technique. So what I want to do today is I would like to um, eventually write a program that produces a table of squares of numbers. So one squared is one, two squared is four, three squared is nine. And of course, I don't just want it to be one through four, I want to be able to see the squares of lots of numbers. I want to have the table have a thousand lines. Obviously, if I just want a table of squares that goes up to four, I could, you know, write that out myself. I don't, and I actually did, here it is. I, I wrote it out myself over on the right. I don't need automation to do that. I want to take a contrary viewpoint here. We shouldn't need automation if I can do things by hand. But maybe you can agree, if I want the table to have tons and tons of different lines, I don't want to have to write each thing out by hand. Um, so the other thing I also I, I don't want to have to worry about is maybe I can do the arithmetic in my head for 1 squared and 2 squared up to, I don't know, 11 squared, 12 squared, 13 squared. But there's going to come a point when I don't want to have to do that arithmetic myself. So it's helpful to have the computer do the math for me. And then finally, I want to maybe engineer a case where I could just use some code to generate each line of the table and maybe just copy and paste it if I want one more line in my table. And we'll see, that's the key, the key recipe for how we use loops in a language. I like to think about it in terms of, can we write code that we could just copy and paste over and over again? So one squared is one, two squared is two, three, or two squared is four, three squared is nine, four squared is 16. Well, where do I start with this? The first thing I want to do is I want to engineer it so that I can just copy and paste one line of the table to make the next one. So I could say, okay, I want four squared is 16. Okay, five squared is 25. I guess the first thing we ought to do is make sure this code works. And then I want to engineer it so that at least the programming language does some of the math for me. So I'm going to start by doing this. And you might notice this seems a bit unnecessary. Of course, I know what one squared is, but I'm going to have printf handle uh, subbing in all of the numerical values. All right, so I say one, and then I write one squared, one times one. You'll notice in C, you, do, you don't get an operator to square things or to take exponents. You have to write one times one or two times two. And you might already notice this is a bit tedious for a human programmer to do. And it turns out that there's a reason that it's also a little bit error prone. We'll try running this to make sure that this works. All right, so it still prints out what I want. And I need to be a little bit careful when I look at my output at each step because I'm going to show in a minute that it's easy for humans that copy and paste thing to make a small error and not notice what they've done. And maybe I'll try and duplicate that. Let's make the table go up to 10. Okay, so six squared is six times six. And then let's see, we've got seven squared is seven times seven. And then I've got eight times eight. And then I've got nine times nine. And then I've got 10 times 10. Oops, I forgot to change this. All right, so I'll save that. And of course there's nothing wrong there. And then I run this. And uh, I scroll down to look at my output. Okay, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25. Looks good. And you might notice that I made a mistake here. 5 squared is 64. No, it isn't. 
And when I copied and pasted, if I'm tweaking, you know, 10 lines of code manually, maybe I forget to change something. And think about this. If I copied and pasted this 100 times, it's pretty likely I, I might let that mistake slip by. I might not notice it. Because as humans, we're not actually very good at finding a needle in a haystack. And you can think about this. If you were writing a program that did this and it, had, it was printing a table of 1,000 lines and you made one tiny error in the middle, who would notice it? It might not get noticed for a long time, maybe not until some damage had been done. So it's not only a good idea to use automation to um, repeat some task, it's also a good way to make sure you don't make a mistake. Because usually if you automate something correctly, sure it could be wrong, but hopefully if you make a mistake, it messes everything up so it's obvious and you can fix it. As opposed to having this needle in a haystack problem, where sure, once you notice it, maybe no big deal. Um, I also want to point out, what about the converse of that? What if I forgot to change the 5 times 5? Or maybe I, I had 8 times 8 uh, set to some other value. Uh, or the square of 8, be not, five, not 8 times 8, but 5 times 5 or something else. Um, it's obvious, I guess, because you know what the square of 8 is. It's supposed to be 64, that the square of 8 isn't 25. But think about if we were trying to deal with the square of like 103 or something like that. If there's an error over here, you may not even notice the mistake ever and the incorrect data could persist, and that's no good. We want a way of proactively eliminating calculation errors in our code. So what I want is the ability to generate a table of not just 10 squares, but maybe 100 squares or 1,000 squares. I also later might want the ability to start my table at a different point. I don't just want to start with 1 squared. Maybe I want to print from 1 squared up to 100 squared. Maybe I want to print from 100 squared up to 115 squared. Who knows? I want to be able to have a flexible program that can generate a table of squares. Um, and maybe you can see, I could just copy and paste this bit of code if I wanted a table of 10 squares. But it was, even then, a little bit tedious. I want to design it so that if I have to copy and paste code, at least it's a little bit less error prone. And so what I notice is, at each step, I print out something squared is something. And then I give a number, and then I give the same number times itself. And I really want to avoid an error where accidentally the thing I put over here isn't the same as the thing I have over here. And it turns out C does give me a feature that we've already seen that could help me with that, which is I could use a variable. So I'll create a variable called n. And I'll start by setting um, n equals to 1. And then in the first step, I will write uh, n square n squared is and then this so I'll write n times n and we'll start from there and the reason I like this is because you might notice now the printf statement that actually prints out the numbers is going to be the same no matter what the value of n is it's literally just this if I want to print out squares of multiple things I could just copy and paste that bit of code I'm going to put some spacing between it to make it more obvious and then I just change the value of n at each step so using existing techniques, we haven't learned any new syntax yet. This is all stuff we could have done uh, as of the previous videos. Using existing techniques, I've already improved my productivity a bit here. I can make the table as long as I want by copying and pasting this snippet over and over again. Okay, so I'll, I'll make it go up to 5. So there's n equals 3, n equals 4, and then there's n equals 5. We'll save that and we'll run it. And hopefully when you're watching this, you can agree that by copying and pasting this way, I avoid having to make tiny changes here. I just change one thing at each step. And so as long as I can verify that, that, that on the left-hand column the table counts up, then I actually have saved myself some time. There's less tedious stuff to do. I just set the value of n once. But it's still going to be really annoying. What if I want a table that goes up to 100? Well, I can copy and paste this 100 times, but then I have to go through and I have to keep changing it. n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, n equals 5. That's pretty annoying. So I want to avoid having to do that. And I think, is there anything else I can use to make this code easier to copy and paste? And I know, of course, our intention isn't to copy and paste code all day long, but is there a way I can avoid having to make you know, copy and paste and then do some extra work? And I notice, what I want to do at each step, I want to print out each row of the table, so 1 squared is 1, and so n would be equal to 1, and then I want to work on the next value of n. After I'm done working with this value of n, I set a new value of n, but actually, I always want the table to step 
uh, in increments of one. Um, the value of n I work with on this line should always be one greater than the value of n on this line. And the value on this line should be one greater. And I think we actually know a way of manipulating variables to do that. So let's, let's rewind this. So I start with n equals one. Certainly I have to choose some kind of starting point. Uh, and then I'm going to actually uh, rewrite the way that I do this. I'm going to print out each line of the table, and then afterwards I'm going to set it up uh, to be ready to print out the next line. And so I'm done with n equals 1, now I want n equals 2. But more generally, what I want is n to have a value that is 1 greater. So I could write n equals n plus 1. And then it, you might notice, uh, I have n equals 1, I print out 1 squared as 1, and then I say n equals n plus 1. So then after that, n is equal to 2, which means I'm all ready to go for my next line of the table. So I'll try this. I've copied and pasted it three times. So 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9. Now take a minute. We haven't seen any new techniques yet. Using only what we know from those previous videos and, of course, this thing, which I know might scare some people, um, we now have it so that if I want 100 lines, I could just copy and paste this 100 times. So here I've got three lines. So I'll get to, let's see, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, so there's 10 lines. If I want 100 lines, and I really want to, I mean, this is a bit ridiculous, but if I want 100 lines, I could just copy and paste this now 10 times. Okay, there we go. Uh, and I'm really trying to prove the point that if I just want a table with 100 lines, I could use our existing techniques to get this. It's, it's pretty clunky, but I could do it. Let's just make sure that runs. Okay, so I, I, I start at 1 squared, and I go up to 100 squared. And you know what? If you think about it, I could even uh, start my table at a different point. I start at 1, and then at each step I add 1 to the previous value. So if I want to start at, let's say, 50 squared and go up to 150 squared, all I do is change this starting value. So, hey, look, I've already, you know, solved a lot of problems here. Um, the problem is with this, because I've got all this repetition, what if it turned out there was a typo in the thing I was repeating? I'd have to change it a hundred times. That's awful. And also, what if it turns out that I want a really strange number of repetitions, like 1,017? I don't want to copy and paste something 1,017 times. And then finally, what if I told you, hey, I don't want squares anymore. I want cubes. Okay, well, that's easy. I'll change the first line. Okay, something cubed is something. And then I print n times n times n. But now you've got to go and change that in every other occurrence. And so you can see, in this case, yes, I can copy and paste my code, but it's pretty ugly if I need to change anything or if I need to modify how many times it gets repeated. And you might also consider the fact that, yes, you could copy and paste it a hundred times, but what if I wanted you to print out a table with a million lines? It might take all afternoon to copy and paste so that you get a million occurrences of that code. So even if copying and pasting is okay and you never have to change anything, there could be a number of repetitions so big that you still don't want to copy and paste. And so I think that, that all of those factors together are enough to justify that we need some automation here. So here is what I actually want to do. Um, we're going to go back to starting at n equals 1. So I, I want to basically, I'm going to draw out what I want. So start at n equals 1. And I want to print the square of everything up to n equals 100. And so what I want to do is I want to repeat the following process. Repeat the following while n is less than or equal to so in math, of course, we use this symbol here for less than or equal to. Repeat the following while n is less than or equal to 100. So what do I do at each step? And that's, that's one of these chunks. I print, and then n squared is, and then I print the value of n squared here. I'm just giving a mock-up of what I want. Uh, and then... And we could actually read this as, we like to use this word in, when we do C programming, increment n. So 
incrementing a value is adding one to that variable and then storing it back in the same place. So n equals n plus 1. Remember that if you just write n plus 1, that does not change the value of n. So if I were to just write this, just n plus 1 by itself, that computes a value, but it doesn't store the value back in n. The only way to modify what's in a variable is with an assignment, with an equal sign. So we want to use n equals n plus 1. So I would like to write a program that does this. Start at n equals 1 and then repeats the following snippet of code until n is greater than 100. So while this condition holds. And you might notice every bullet point I have except for this one I can already do because I've already done them. I know how to start at n equals 1. That's this. And I know how to handle this stuff in the middle because that's this thing here. The question is, how do I repeat something while a condition holds? And the answer will probably not surprise you that much. So remember that this condition here is a yes or no question. At each step, I can ask the question, is n less than or equal to 100? If the answer is yes, do the stuff in the middle again. If the answer is no, then stop. And it turns out that C has a construct that allows us to implement this. And it's something called a loop. And what I'm going to start with is something called a while loop. And that's no coincidence at all. The word while is very significant here. So I'm going to clear this. And I'm going to erase all of this junk here. Now the first step, if you want to write a while loop at this point in the course, is um, start like I started earlier. Write it out manually. Write out print 1 squared equals 1. And then see what you can do to automate it so that it would be possible, if you needed to, to just copy and paste without any changes, copy and paste the same snippet of code. We saw already that if I literally copy and paste this piece of code five times, I will get a table that has five lines. Once you have a piece of code that you can just copy and paste, do the following. So I want to repeat this code while n is less than or equal to 100. And then you take the stuff that you want to repeat and you stick it inside of two curly brackets. And traditionally, and if we're sensible, in good style, we indent. We don't have to. It turns out the compiler doesn't care, but humans love this. If we have the code indented, it makes it much easier to see what we are repeating. When we run this while loop, we repeat everything inside of the curly brackets. And when the while loop is finally over, then we go down below the last curly bracket, and I'm going to print out the word done here, just to make it clear what's happening. So while n is less than or equal to 100, do all of these things. Everything inside the curly brackets is called the loop body. It is the contents of the loop. And each time the loop runs, and we call this iterating, each time the loop iterates, everything inside the loop body is run. I'm going to define this in greater detail in just a second, but first we'll run through this. OK, so we start at 1 squared. We walk all the way up to 100 squared, and then we print out the word done. So this is an example of a while loop. And it turns out that there are three key ingredients in a while loop. So the first ingredient is you need somewhere to start. In this case, my starting condition, which always happens before the word while, I set n is equal to 1. Um, you also need your second ingredient. You need some condition that tells you, should I continue, yes or no? And if the answer, this is a yes or no question. If the answer is yes, you execute the entire loop body. If the answer is no, then you skip down to below the loop. And you might notice that I want here, what I want is this operator, the less than or equal to operator that we know from mathematics. But you might notice there is no key on your keyboard with that symbol on it. So instead, we like to, in C, use a combination of the less than sign and the equal to sign. Uh, you should experiment on your own time with what happens if you just write n is less than 100. That's still a yes or no question. You could also ask, is n greater than 100? But not in this case. Um, and so you can ask any yes or no question you want in C. Uh, for now, we'll stick with less than or equal to. So the first ingredient for a loop is you need somewhere to start. The second ingredient is you need what I'm going to call a continuation condition, a yes or no question, where if the answer is yes, you perform the loop body again. If the answer is no, the loop is over and you skip down to below the curly brackets. And the third thing you need is some way to make progress. Um, 
after each iteration of the loop body, after each time the loop runs, you need to set the loop up to continue and run the next iteration. So after I've printed out what 90 squared is, I have to set it up so that we can work on 91 squared. And so we typically call this an incrementation. Now it doesn't actually have to be n equals n plus 1. For example, uh, I'm going to make the table first. I'm going to change it so the table only prints out the squares up to 10. So we'll try that out. OK, so 1 squared is 1. There goes to 10 squared is 10. If after each step I write n equals n plus, let's do n plus 2 instead of n plus 1. That still gives us a way to make progress. But the progress is a bit different. Instead of going up by 1, we go up by 2. And here it says 1 squared is 1, 3 squared is 9, 5, 7, 9. But wait a minute, it never prints out 10. And I'll leave that as an exercise. We will talk about that in a future video. But it turns out that when n equals 9, we add 2 to n, and then it turns into 11. And then, of course, is it, is it the case that 11 is less than or equal to 10? Well, no. And if the answer is no, then we uh, don't continue the loop, and the loop ends. So one last detail. Uh, there, the subsequent videos will talk about the mechanics in, in more detail. We need all three ingredients. If one of the three ingredients doesn't work, if we don't have a starting point, if we don't have a continuation condition that makes sense, or we don't have an incrementation, the loop will be broken. And we'll see in a future video what a broken loop looks like. Uh, and then also, I want to point out, how what does a loop actually do in terms of control flow? As I run through the code, what happens? And the brief outline is, as usual, we start at the top of our code. We, we run one line at a time. So here, I might even have a diagram on the side, n equals 1. Every, when we hit the word while, we follow the following procedure. So we ask the question, is n less than or equal to 10? If the answer is yes, then we perform everything in this loop body and we ask the question again. If the answer is no, we skip down to the bottom. When we get to the, if we're inside the loop and we get to the end of the loop body, so here, we always, always ask that question again. The only time that we ever end the loop is if the answer to this question comes back as a no. If the answer is yes, we do everything inside the brackets and then come back and ask the question again. And that means it's important, of course, that we have a question where eventually the answer will be no and the loop will be able to end. And I'll talk about that in the next video.